Thanks for tuning into the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder. This week, Sierra Berge is joining me. She is the Houston Texans' return to performance lead. She's a doctor in physical therapy as well as being CSCS. We're going to talk all about what it's like to take the injured players and get them back on the gridiron. Hope you enjoy the show. In the meantime, follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder. And click the subscribe button. And if there's one of those alert bell icons, click that while you're at it. Enjoy the conversation. So, Sierra, you 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 began more or less uh, at Duke. You've you've gone back and forth and and to different schooling. But give us a little bit of like what your path has been leading up to getting your doctorate in physical therapy and and landing a gig with the Texans a few years ago. Yeah, for sure. Um, So I grew up in Wisconsin and ended up going to undergrad at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Wasn't fully sure what I was interested in um, and kind of was interested in personal training or strength and conditioning and something in that realm. Um, So actually, I graduated undergrad, still not even having really physical therapy on my radar. Um, And my first job out of undergrad was working in a PT clinic that had like a performance program associated with it. So I worked for the performance program. And that was kind of my first exposure to physical therapy. Um, and I think, you know, we would have athletes there that ran out of visits for an ACL or something like that. And they'd transition over to the performance program. And they arrived at me with me at me with like, I just had questions like, what has their journey been up to this point? So I was kind of like grew in curiosity about physical therapy in general. Um, so started to explore that as a potential option and ended up thinking that was a, some, a direction that I wanted to head. Cause I just knew like. I could bring strength and conditioning into that, which I was really, really passionate about, but just knew I would have like broader career options. Um, so while I was working there, I took prereqs um, just in Milwaukee um, and then ended up deciding to apply to PT school. And I just chose like geographically different places to apply to because I was like, well, I can live anywhere for three years. And so um, Duke happened to be on my list. And uh, yeah, I went there for an interview. Absolutely loved the people. It just felt like a good fit. It felt like home. Um, was lucky enough to be accepted there. And so went to PT school at Duke for uh, three years. Um, and I had a phenomenal experience there. Like, yeah, where I went to undergrad did not have a very strong sports culture. I don't think you've probably heard of uh, Un- University of Wisconsin Milwaukee sports very much. So it was really fun to be in a completely different environment at Duke and be like part of a really, really strong sports culture there. Um, and so obviously had my fair share of men's basketball games and all that stuff while I was going to grad school. And yeah, I had a great time. Um, after I finished PT school, I knew I wanted to get better at my job faster. And so for me, that looked like exploring residency programs. Um, and so I applied for a sports physical therapy residency program. I applied at four or five different places. And I ended up at Houston Methodist Sugarland, which is in, in Houston, Texas, just a suburb there. Um, And that's where I did my first year of training post physical therapy school. And again, I chose that location because I loved the people. I've kind of always followed good people um, and relationships everywhere I've gone. And so I spent a year doing residency there um, and then ended up kind of getting hired on to be on faculty for the residency there at Houston Methodist Sugarland and was there for three years in total. Um, And while I was there, I did a manual therapy fellowship. Um, through Institute of Athlete Regeneration, which was started by my residency faculty. Um, So it was just kind of a natural transition to keep learning from the people that I learned from during residency. Um, And then after three years in the outpatient setting, I mean, I learned a ton. I had a great time. I just was kind of curious what higher level athletics would look like and if that would be a good fit for me. I didn't really know. Um, So I knew coming from Duke that um, Duke had a division one athletics fellowship program. And I was like, well, I'll apply for it and I'll go for the interview if they allow me to. And I'll see if like college athletics seems like a good fit for me or not. I really wasn't like dead set on getting the job. It was more like an exploratory. Am I interested in higher level athletics? And again, I went for the interview, loved the people, loved the setting. It felt like the next great fit for me. Um, and so Luckily, they offered me the spot to take that fellowship position back at Duke. So I moved back to Duke um, and did a fellowship year there, got to experience all the different sports at Duke. And yeah, we can certainly chat about that more, but I had a great time there and got to experience all the different sport cultures and culture of care, because obviously how you care for a wrestler is going to be different than how you care for men's basketball. Um, And so just understanding all the different cultures of care and had a really valuable experience there um, and great mentorship there. And then they ended up 
kind of creating space for me to stay at Duke. So I stayed for two and a half years beyond my fellowship year and just worked there full time. Um, and I worked in the Olympic sports setting primarily um, and sort of got introduced to sports science there. And that's where I started to kind of learn more about load monitoring and force plates and all the different technology that of course is becoming very, very popular and utilized. Um, and I just had the freedom to kind of dabble in and learn about all that stuff um, while I was at Duke. And then kind of something came up. I got a phone call, I don't know, in February of 2020 before COVID hit, if I would be interested in a position with the Texans. And I said, no, but I'll talk to them um, anyway, because I was so, so happy at Duke. I loved the people. I loved the culture. I loved college athletics. Um, and so I ended up going for an interview with the Texans. Um, and it seemed like a really good opportunity. Um, so I said, all right, they offered me a spot. I said, yes, I'll go there as long as I can finish the fall season at Duke because I had started some programs there and it was really important to me to leave Duke in a sustainable place with the things that I'd started. I didn't wanna just start a fire and leave it burning. Um, so that was really, really important to me. And luckily the Texans graciously allowed me to stay through the fall season um, at Duke. And so I started at the Texans in November of 2020 um, and have been there since, so for about the past two and a half years. So that's kind ah. of the journey in a nutshell or not. <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, it's a big nutshell. I love it though. That's, <laughs> that, that's fabulous. Well, and just side note, what were your sports growing up? So I played soccer a little bit growing up. I actually grew up on a farm. So I was very into that side of things, into animals and that side of things. So that was, I know it's not a sport. I'm not saying it is, but that's what took up a lot of my time was um, like dairy cows and showing dairy cows and working on the farm. Um, and then I actually danced. I started dance when I was 14, most, mostly like modern or contemporary. Um, and like looking back, it's always easier to connect the dots in reverse, but I loved dance because I loved, I got to teach. I got to analyze movement. I got to like get a good understanding of movement and watching movement. And so I think like the physical nature of manual labor, honestly, from working on a farm I played sports, but like, I don't know. I was so busy with other stuff that I didn't put a lot of time into sports, to be honest. And then dance growing up, teaching and like analyzing movement and all of that. So I danced through college and then um, was in a company for a couple of years after college. And I think like all of those worlds sort of combined and it makes sense now to get me on the path that I'm on. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And by yeah. the way, I think farm strength uh, completely <laughs> overwhelmed is, is so much better than gym strength. Just in general, like in fact, I have strength. this. I've got this vision that the health clubs in the future will be on farms, and and <laughs> you get a membership, and then you got to go milk the cow, you got to throw hay bales, you got to unload this and that, you got to turn the soil, and you get rock solid <laughs> compared to sitting on some upholstery seat and lifting a roller up and down. Listen, with your shins you let something. me know when you want to start that. I'm in. Let's. Oh uh, yeah, heck yeah. But I'm. That's I. They, so that's kind of a unique story in itself. With, with your uh, athletic background, but it makes complete sense when it comes to dance. I mean, yeah. the, the, the understanding of how the body moves and the intricacies and the, and the grace and, sure. and really getting intrigued by that and, and going deeper into an analytic kind of mindset. So yeah, it makes complete sense. Now, yeah. you mentioned, though, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. No, you're I great. <laughs> okay. So Duke <laughs> University, you did Olympic sports. Which Olympics? So winter, summer, or all of them? So that's, I didn't know this either until I started working in college athletics, but they basically call Olympic sports all of the sports that aren't basketball or um, football. So it's, it doesn't mean that the athletes go to the Olympics or anything. It's just like, a garbage can term for not <laughs> basketball, not football. So it's like, I don't know, soccer, lacrosse, oh fencing, softball, baseball, swimming, like everything else. Yeah. Okay. Most obscure, obscure sports athlete that you've had to work with. Like, I'm just thinking the movie Dodgeball, the OSQ, obscure <laughs> sports quarterly. Like, where would you, what sport would you find that you've worked with somebody, whether it's like, uh, you know, uh, a uh, teenage curler or uh, okay interesting whatever um man I'm trying to think I mean we had fencing at Duke and I knew nothing about that frankly when I moved to Duke I didn't even know what field hockey was I barely knew what lacrosse was um so those are really? all like I, yeah I mean I grew up in Wisconsin? the Midwest like it's not a hotbed for lacrosse yeah, and certainly not. not field hockey so Northeast. I like barely knew what those things were um 
And then like, uh, probably I have a skier that I've worked really closely with. And that was like brand new for me. Like I didn't know much about what his requirements were for his job. So that was like a phenomenal, like learning experience. Um, but I don't so know you're not familiar me. with any stick sports, any sports that involve a, a stick. Not really. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Just, hockey, ice hockey, but not okay. field hockey. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> All right. Well, you mentioned that there's, uh, what did you call it? Culture. Uh, there was a term you used that. Sport culture at Duke? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how does it vary from one sport to the next? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Like obviously coaching staff is going to vary. So like each coaching staff, obviously every sport has a different coaching staff. And so the culture that they set is going to be different. But if you think about it from like a medical standpoint, especially in college athletics, like cultures of care are going to vary. Like you think about our wrestling athletic trainer did a phenomenal job there because she's like, these guys aren't going to have someone go to doctor's appointments with them when they become an adult out in the real world. Like I need them to be educated and be able to relay information from a doctor's appointment and tell me what their understanding is. So she would always make them go to their doctor's appointments by themselves to help them build a life skill of understanding how to navigate medicine. Where if you think about a men's basketball athlete, that's not gonna be the appropriate culture of care for them because they're gonna be used to very concierge situation because a lot of them are gonna go to the NBA. They're gonna have someone go with them all the time. They're gonna have someone help interpret those things. They're gonna need more of an advocate as opposed to learning to advocate for themselves. And so even like something as small as that, like that's correct for both of those cultures, but it's just different. Like how you're going to handle a men's basketball athlete because of where they're likely to head is going to be different than how you handle a wrestler. It's going to be a little bit more like autonomy driven with a wrestler because they're going to have to be responsible for their own healthcare when they, when they graduate. And so I thought the way that like our athletic trainers approach that, and we're very, very aware of that was really, really cool and special. That's really cool. How does that filter down into the, the, the strength coach or performance coaches? Does it, or is it mainly just kind of up in the medical realm when it comes to the culture of care? Yeah, good question. I don't know. I think, I mean, I think like each sport is going to have a different culture as far as their desire to lift and their training age and how much they've experienced. So I think that that varies for sure. Um, you know, obviously I would assume all of our football athletes grew up lifting weights in high school where like our field hockey athletes maybe have never lifted weights in their life. So like, I think training age is gonna differ from a strength and conditioning standpoint and their desire and their buy into applicability for weightlifting for sport, you know, like that's gonna vary too. You know, sometimes our, our soccer players weren't that bought in because lifting culture isn't a super big piece of their sport, it's just not. Um, and that's not a criticism. So they'd have to figure out how to build buy-in in a different way with those athletes versus the wrestlers were like, oh yeah, bigger muscles, the better. Like they were all bought into lifting. So I, th I think like each sport kind of had a different um, belief and training experience when it came to strength and conditioning. And I think that that's kind of the way that the, the strength coaches had to be adaptable. Okay. Now you mentioned you didn't want to start a fire and walk away with it unattended and do yeah. what was the fire that you you kindled what was it that you the program that you started so um as far as like sports science and technology goes within our olympic sports um we didn't really have anybody that was um managing that technology and so our soccer team our women's soccer team actually was one of the first ones to start it and they catapult approached them and was like hey interested in this and of course it's like a recruiting tool and they it is valuable data, but they just didn't have anybody to manage it or help them with it. The coaching staff was like, yeah, we're interested. We don't have the manpower to figure out how to do this. And I was like, okay, well, I'm interested. I know nothing about it. Um, so I just read a bunch of research articles, learned on my own, kind of helped try to create my own um, system of kind of performance and, and my athlete monitoring that fit into their environment. And so I had kind of started to build that, but that system itself was very dependent on me, the human to run it. And so it's like, okay, how can I build sustainability in that system? So women's soccer isn't dependent on the presence of Sierra to run their technology. How can I build a system where people can filter in and filter out of it and make it a little bit more sustainable? Um, and so women's soccer started with that, but then there were other sports as well that had kind of jumped on the train as far as technology goes. And I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I started, a problem and I was the solution to it at first. And I didn't, I didn't want to leave them with me being the only solution. I wanted that those programs to be able to sustain on beyond my existence there. 
And how are they doing now? They're doing well. I think they've continued to grow um, and they uh, even more teams have technology now and um, a physical therapist that they hired to kind of take my spot um, is uh, doing technology for, I think, three or four teams. And I was just doing it for one or two at the time. So things are sustaining well and they're continuing to grow. I think they just hired a um, an intern for the first time. And so, yeah, the program is growing, which is like super cool to see. Very cool. Yeah. So you went from multi-sport disciplinarian with your physical therapy at Duke, from from fencing to field hockey, lacrosse, and the likes yeah. that you just described, to an NFL team. Now, granted, you know, within the NFL team, you've got players of varying desires and demands, right? For the sure. kicker, the lineman, the O-line, and the corners, and so on. So in, in essence, even though it's one sport, there are many demands, physical attributes that each player is ideal for, and so on. So it it wouldn't be like going to an NBA team where all the players right. are for the most part very, very similar. So what is that like? What is that like going from so many different sports to the Houston Texans? Yeah, I think um, I think being at so many different sports serves you well because I can't possibly be an expert in soccer and fencing and lacrosse and field hockey. Like I'm I'm not. I can't possibly even be an expert in that. So you know, being at Duke and working with all those different sports and even working in an outpatient clinic where you'll get a random person that does Taekwondo and you're like, wow, I know nothing about that. How can I help you? Um, so it's really helped me to like develop this skill set of trying to understand and analyze a sport and also like developing a relationship with the athlete to be curious about what they have to do. Like, hey, I know these things about what you have to physically do to get ready what are the things that you know and how can we develop a collaborative relationship to get you back to sport? Um, and so like okay. my ability to, um, or the skill set that I gained at Duke and even working in the outpatient setting to be able to analyze sport and be comfortable asking my patients curious questions about what they have to get back to and not worried that they'll lose faith in me because I don't know everything about their sport, right? Like developing that skill set to have a collaborative relationship with your patient has served me super well in the football environment because, again, I'm having to analyze sport. What are the demands of a linebacker? What are the demands of a defensive back? What are the demands of a running back? And same thing, just watching sport, asking questions, asking feedback from the athlete too. Like, hey, this is how I had planned this agility drill for the day, for example. Like, is there anything that you want to add? Does that sound good? Does that So like really developing a collaborative relationship with the athlete um, I think is super, super important. So that way they feel invested and involved in their care. And so at the football setting, it's, it's no different. Like I use my eyeballs to try and come up with a plan of what makes sense to me and then use the athlete as a professional resource. No one's going to be a better expert than they are. And so I just use them as a resource as well. And so the skill sets that I've built at, at Duke and stuff has, has, you know, lended well and transitioned well to football. So when you do a needs analysis, when you analyze a position or sport, what are the main things that you're looking for? Give me like a sports analysis 101. Yeah, I think like what are the global categories that most sports need to have? Some amount of acceleration or linear speed, some amount of deceleration, some amount of change of direction, some amount of power probably. And so what are the directions that they normally move in, right? Like, um, what are the acceleration demands as far as like distance and velocity, right? Our offensive linemen move probably more often laterally, right? And maybe forward a little bit, but they're not going to have to do a 20 yard acceleration. So kind of analyzing the distances of each of those categories, the intensities of each of those categories, the volumes of each of those categories, and then the directions at which they move and just kind of applying that. Yeah, and O line also just stepping backwards. What's that like? Do you also look at like common injury sites, like from one position to the next, or just in general? Um, I think from like a quote unquote prevention, you can kind of look at common injury sites. But um, we know like in football, for example, our guys that run a lot of high speed yards are going to be more prone to hamstring and hamstring strains. So like things like that, yes. But I don't know. I don't know how much that at least at this point is informing like work, like common injuries, maybe injury history for that athlete, but not common injuries for the position. So nothing to kind of bulletproof one area over another necessarily based on the uh, history well, of those things. I think our S and C, you know, coaches do a good job of kind of trying to understand that and understand injury history for athletes and 
and modifying, like, obviously we have a big focus on hamstring strength and hamstring and high speed running and, you know, make sure, making sure that we're dosing all that stuff appropriately. So our strength staff probably takes more of a special interest in the programming specifics for that stuff um, than I do at this point. So Sierra, for the listening audience, can you yeah. give me like, what is your official title with the Texans <laughs> and, and what does that involve? What's your role and responsibility? Obviously a physical therapist with background and strength conditioning, but yeah, what's yeah. that like? My official title is return to performance lead. Um, and so we have a little bit of a unique model, at least a unique model within the um, NFL. And so kind of we have a big sports performance team and that's made up of wellness, which is our nutrition department, sports science, which is our sports science department, uh, strength and conditioning, and then medical. And medical is kind of branched off just this last year into two different departments. One of them is the department of athletic training and one of them is the department of return to performance. So there's kind of those two umbrellas un or those two departments within the medical umbrella. And I am in one of those umbrellas. Um, so our athletic training staff at this point they manage so much. They manage a lot of the logistics. There's an extraordinary amount of logistics that go into getting an NFL team on the field and on the road. They manage a lot of the very, very acute injuries that are not going to miss time. So like guys that are just dealing with groin pain, but are going to make it through the season guys that have a little ankle sprain, but are going to still end up playing on Sunday. And then they manage all the preparation for practice um, for the athletes and then manage things during practice. And then obviously the acute injuries that happen on the field. And then the department on my side, um, Sue Falsoni, who was the first female head athletic trainer in the um, in pro sports, she's the uh, director of, of my department, and then it's me and two, me and one other person. Sue is with you? Yeah. No way. When did she join the Texans? I had no idea. In uh, March. Oh yeah. my gosh! All right. Yeah, so, so for for the listening audience, so yeah, <laughs> Sue. Uh, she was with the Los Angeles Dodgers. That's where she cut her teeth as the first female athletic trainer. She is amazing. You know, yeah. if you've listened, I, I am one of the presenters at Perform Better's training summits where Sue has been doing that for years. If you want, and if you're into dry needling, she has been leading the charge in that. I had no idea that you worked with Sue. How cool. Next time, yeah. give her a big hug from me. So, well, that's really cool. Okay, so what... When is it that a player is going through your door? Yeah, that's what it, so our workflow is basically any athlete that's going to miss time. So if it's like um, a hamstring strain all the way down, which is like what, three to six weeks, whatever, two to six weeks, all the way down to like an ACL tear that's a season ender. So anything that's going to miss time enters into our workflow. And so the people in our department, so me, Sue, and my coworker, John, and then we have a strength coach, um, the assistant head strength coach, Joe Distor is also part of our team. Um, so they, the athlete will fall into our workflow and we'll be the director of that athlete's care. And so it almost makes it sound like things are really siloed, but at the same time, like our athlete has a care team, which involves someone from every department. So athlete X strains their hamstring. They have someone from the Department of Return to Performance, which is the department that I'm in. They have an athletic trainer on their team. They have a dietitian on their team. They have a strength coach on their team. They have a sports scientist on their team. And that care team is the one that, manage, that manages them all the way back. And then someone from my department, so either Sue, me, Joe, or John, are the directors of that athlete's care, kind of the quarterback of their team. And then we take them through their care process. So it sounds siloed, but it's not. The goal is for it to not be siloed. The goal is for it to be collaborative and just have like a quarterback kind of that's in charge of that athlete's return. Nice. Okay. So yeah, hamstring and ACL. I, I saw somewhere not too long ago, 11% of NFL players will experience ACL injuries, whether it's going to re remove them from the playing field and they will lose playing time mm -hmm. or, or career ending or, mm -hmm. or just something very simple. So uh, uh, hamstrings and ACLs, anything <laughs> else up there in the top buckets? Oh yeah, of course. Um, I mean, any muscle strain, hamstring strain, quad strain, adductor strain, any ankle sprain, high ankle sprain. Hold on. Yeah. So you got the whole team? I mean, so anything that's missing time. Yeah, exactly. So anything that's going to miss time. So okay, we had like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So not necessarily 
like not every single athlete, not, not our whole 53 man roster. It's just the guys. So if we have four people out with a hamstring strain at once, like, yeah, they're all in our workflow along with a guy that tore his ACL and whatever. So it's like anything that's missing time is in our workflow. Yeah. Do you notice any trends with those individuals that are missing time with the non-contact injuries? Because we're talking for the most, I mean, ACL could be contact. It could be somebody just got wrenched yeah. and their bodies were torquing, but I'm thinking of like Julian Edelman several years ago. Uh, there's several that uh, players that have just juked and the wrong timing and everything. And that femur tib just rotated away yeah. from each other at too much of a speed. Uh, and then hamstrings also usually deceleration, change of direction. You're no right. doubt. So much decelerated force. So yeah. do you notice, do you notice uh, any type of physical trend, joint mechanics, um, structure positioning that is kind of common amongst these players or is it all over the place? Um, I wouldn't say it's all over the place, but at the same time, I would say like, a lot of the things from like a global perspective that we might find are very common amongst all athletes, right? Like most athletes probably need to work. This is a garbage can statement, but need to work on hip mobility and ankle mobility from a mobility standpoint. Right. And that's like not unique to anything. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's some athletes that, you know, their movement patterns or their movement strategies might be a little bit more dangerous than someone else's. And that doesn't mean that's, good or bad, but they don't have a large enough vocabulary and the words of movement that they can express are maybe more dangerous strategies. And so sometimes they don't have as broad of a movement vocabulary, I think, for athletes that have kind of chronic repetitive injuries at times. And then, I mean, it's hard to know. There's so many factors, obviously, that go into injury, but I would say like, there's the commonalities that a lot of athletes have, whether it be like ankle and hip mobility, and then just movement strategy things that, that you'll notice with athletes as well. So we've got two categories that you just mentioned, uh, acute and chronic. Yeah. So, a, and historically, physical therapists have been exquisitely trained and educated on the acute protocols or acute care protocols. Sure. And, but what about the chronic? What about the recurring? Because I have found through my experience with physical therapists that they try to take that same approach, same protocol, and apply it to the chronic issues. And it unfortunately comes up short. There's other underlying factors and it's not yeah. just a single joint that needs some type of protocol or re restoration or whatnot. Do you have a difference in terms of your approach, your assessments, uh, if you do have protocols? What does that look like between the two? Yeah, I think it's like, it can be dangerous to just like, worry about only the acuteness of the injury in that specific joint, because it's like, okay, what's the thing that led to this? Like, how can we look more globally with everything? And so I think that, yeah, we can make someone's ankle sprain heal and make them return back. But like, what are the issues up or down the chain that may have led to this happening? And so I think it's really, really important to take a global approach with, with all athletes. Like, yes, we are in charge of making sure that your healing tissue is healing at the appropriate timeline but what about the other 75% of your body? Like, how is that? How is that moving? How is that functioning? How might that be relating to your injury? How is maybe your right shoulder mobility not helping your left knee heal? Like it's all possible, right? So you don't want to get too distracted from the actual healing tissue, but at the same time, you don't want to get too focused on it. So everything's always a balance, but um, for both of our kind of acute and chronic cases, we try to take a little bit of a global look and try and work on those global issues while they're out. And so hopefully they come back better than ever before. That's ultimately the goal is Great. to make sure that they come back with better mobility in other areas or better strength in other areas. So, you know, yeah, letting the local things heal, but taking a global assessment approach, whether it's acute or chronic, I think that that's um, doing the best for the athlete. I love how you lead right into the next question. So when it comes to global <laughs> assessment or, or localized assessment, I imagine localized assessment, assessment you're going to put them on a table, you're going to sure. use your, your mental goniometer, and you're <laughs> going to establish proper flexion, adduction, internal, external right, rotation, right, right. whatever joint we're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and, so I, and that's probably just traditional fare that we're talking about. But when it comes yeah. to global assessment, what are you doing? What, how do you globally assess them? Is it through um, 
uh, gait mechanics, running multi-directional movements? Uh, are you doing captured videos and freeze framing and looking at stuff or force plate? What, what's, your, what's your approach with that? Yeah, I think that there's so many different ways that you can approach this. And I think that what's important to state is like, there is no best way, but you just need to have a system. Um, and so whatever your system is, if you are really into gate and want to analyze things through gate and think that you can dive deeper based on that, that's great. If you want to use FMS, that's fine. Like there's multiple different ways that you can sort of develop a flagging system. Like, hey, that looks a little off. Let me dive deeper there. Hey, that looks a little off. Let me dive deeper there. So it doesn't necessarily matter, but I think like there is no best system. You just have to have a system. Otherwise you're always going to be chasing something, right? So what's your system? What's my system? <laughs> um, so I just like to look at things from like a global standpoint. How do athletes move? Just watch them squat, watch them lunge, watch them do simple movements, watch them jump if they're able to, and just watch their movement patterns. I think you can pick up a lot from just watching very simple tasks and then you just dive deeper from there. So if you notice a lot of trunk flexion and not much knee flexion with a jump, all right, what does that mean? So the, like you just kind of develop movement flags as you're watching someone squat and lunge and move and walk and run. You just develop little movement flags and then you just dive deeper at those joints. Okay, but that requires an experienced eye who has been observing movement for a certain period of time. Meaning that, you know, you get a student from, from Duke University oh, yeah. their freshman right. year and you tell them to watch this person do a squat and they look and sure, they're going to look for like shin angle and spine angle, right. knee valgus, knee varus, you know, all uh, head position and so on. But you <laughs> having had a few extra years of observation, you go, oh, look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. I see how they're just barely shifting their, their weight over to the left and their torso rotates right. Right. You know, and it's almost imperceptible. I guess that I'm bringing this up because there yeah. are, there are landmarks that, on, along this observational journey of experience. Sure. And, and when for you personally, when do you, have you experienced this? Have you experienced suddenly you see more? You watch mm. somebody move and you're going, oh my gosh, yeah. look at that. Or, or you blur your vision at a body as it moves and go, where is that mass traveling? And in a way that you didn't look before, are, are these things that are you're experiencing as your for eye sure. gets more accustomed to it? No, for sure. And I think that like when you first graduate PT school, like my exam, like when I evaluated a patient is completely different now but I had this system and it was this very rigid system that I followed. And that's good. Like, it's great to have a system. So maybe that's FMS or something like that, which is fine. I think that's a great system. It's a system that has numbers associated with it. It's a great place to start. And then as you learn more, as you have mentors, as you have other people that kind of fine tune, you want to take in information from the people that are around you. And sometimes that's the athlete itself. And that helps you fine tune your system and add something in, take something away. So start with some kind of basic structure and then let the people around you mold that structure. And so like just having Sue, you know, working with Sue, like, you know, I thought I had a decent eye for movement. And then I started working with Sue and it's like, whoa, she sees way more things than I did. Like that's broadening my eyes. And so it's like, okay, let me be more curious and ask her great questions to help me become, see what, she, see what she's seeing. And so that's like refining my, structure of movement analysis because Sue's refining it because she's a new person that's into my world. And so I think it's like, start with a structure, start with a plan. It's okay if it's not perfect, it will never become perfect, but the people around you will refine it for the rest of your career. Okay, putting you on the hot seat right now. <laughs> what are the things that you have thrown out and what are the things that you've put in to your system? Man, that's a good question. Um. I think I started my system with like very, very basic single joint analysis. Like how does the knee bend? How does the hip move? How does the ankle move? Which is fine. But like now I can take in a compound movement and be able to let that, you know, lead me in certain directions. So before, like when I was first starting out, I maybe saw stuff wrong with the squat, but didn't have a clue where to go with that. So I was like, I'm just not going to do that because I'm a little uncomfortable with that, which like 
is very, very basic, but I was super comfortable with like hip range of motion, ankle range of motion, knee range of motion. So it was very basic and very segmental, um, like unisegmental. And now things are a lot more multi-segmental. And so then I started getting a lot more information from compound movements like squat and things like that. Um, and then now like Sue and the strength coach that I work with have like challenged me a lot for something that's even more compound, like sprinting. And so, right. So like now I'm starting to figure out, okay, how can I use uh, how can I maybe throw the squat aside a bit, not aside, that's a slower movement, but like, how can I analyze movement at a higher velocity? So it's almost like, I think as I've grown in um, analyzing movement, I've just become better at analyzing movements that have higher velocities associated with them, right? At first I couldn't handle any kind of velocity at all. It was like isolated. And now it's being able to handle more and more. So like I only look at isolated joint movement at the very tail end as a rule in rule out thing. I don't look at that with everything anymore because I can get more from compound movements. Yeah. So in essence, you go from a telescopic lens yeah. down to a microscopic and, and you can have that aperture kind of go back and forth depending upon what you see and, and what the athlete needs for sure. That's, that's the brilliance of, of a true professional is to, to be able to adjust based on what you're seeing. So right. with that sprinting, mm -hmm. see, you just, you just provide <laughs> uh -oh. more questions as you answer. Well, with sprinting, we have contralateral motion. We have for unilateral sure. action. And mm -hmm. yet when we go back into the gym, the majority of movements are bilateral. Uh, we just be, keep on talking about the squat, but there's only one time the linemen are really gonna need to squat. And that's as soon as the ball is snapped, they're coming out of it mm -hmm. and they need to do something. And if they have both feet on the ground, they're gonna get knocked over uh, one way or the other. So now we're talking about unilateral movements. How, uh, and with sprinting, you're obviously looking at that. So how much do you bring that into play when you're, when we're talking about like assessing, are, are you looking at how one side behaves compared to the other? Are you kind of just making a mental note going, oh, that's, that's something that I might look into later? Or is it something that kind of creates a flag for you that, okay, there is this imbalance, asymmetry or whatever. Should we explore that more? Yeah. Are you talking from like a training standpoint or from like still an analysis standpoint? I would, uh, more analysis because you're, you're in the return to performance or, or better yet, how about this? As, as they're coming out of your door, because I, I see like the a, athletic training and return performance as being almost like the indoor and the outdoor. Like mm -hmm. players are coming in to see the athletic trainer or they're hovering around the, the waiting room. And then some will go over to you because they need you more, but you're in essence trying to bring them back out on the field. So it's mm -hmm. almost like this circle going on. So for those athletes that are heading back out your door, getting ready to return to the field, what, what strategies, what, what uh, protocols, what, what systems do you have in place to get them to the point where you're going, yep, yeah, you're ready to return? Mm -hmm. I think like, and this has been big to, you know, learn from and explore and create a system with Sue, but it's always beginning with the end in mind. So what is our end point from a performance standpoint? What is our end point from all of the categories that we care about? Like from a performance side, what is their end point for linear, linear acceleration or max velocity from a performance side? What is their end point for deceleration from a sports side? What is their end point? So all the categories that we care about and believe in, what is their end point? And then how are we reverse engineering things all the way back to A. So if we go from A to Z, like what does A look like? And what does all the way up to Z look like? And so that's just like how we've kind of created our system. And so maybe this things in the weight room with a strength and conditioning coach might start at letter M. Okay, what does our A to M look like? And just kind of coming up with this progression in all of the categories that we care about and believe in. So that way there isn't really ever a door that they're walking through, but just this long, this long hallway, maybe more so. So it's never very segmented in care. It's always a smooth transition from, from space to space because it doesn't matter if letter M takes place in the athletic training room or in the weight room or out on the field. It just matters that that letter has to take place. And so that's kind of how we've started is like start with the end in mind and then reverse engineer things back to the start. And so when it comes to the full roster, how many athletes are you typically working with any given week? Um, I mean, 
in like right now and through training camp, we'll have a 90 man roster. And then um, otherwise there's 53 on the regular roster. And then I think 16 or something like that on the practice squad in regular season. So roughly 70 to 90 athletes are in there at all times. Our workflow really depends. It can be like three to 20. So it just really depends on time and season and who's in the building. And so it, it really, really varies. Well, I imagine it's uh, if we looked at a line graph, we would probably see it spiking up early, dropping down mid season, then spiking up again as you get toward the postseason. Uh, sure. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Because I'm imagining yeah. that the the resiliency, just the tissue resiliency, hasn't been built up early in the sp- in summer camp, and yeah. with the reduced amount of time that the players are actually returning to summer camp and getting ready mm-hmm. for the uh, preseason matches, not to mention just the first couple of weeks of the season, yeah. you're going to have a lot more disruption, a lot uh, in regards to tissue joint action, for force sure. production. So, so you're really busy come July, August, September. Typically, yes. Yeah, I would say typically, yes. But some years you get lucky. It just really depends. Yeah, yeah every uh, year is a little bit different. <laughs> Interesting. And and you came into the Texans in the midst of COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you noticed through the last few years if there's been a difference as we have climbed out of that bubble, so to speak? Um, I don't know that there's been a difference climbing out of that. I think that the interesting part or the the difference between college and professional athletics is college athletics, obviously the athletes are there on site to train all of the time. And so their development happens under the same roof, um, where in the case of professional athletics, you have athletes coming in and coming out of the team. They're not necessarily there for this four year period. Right. And they also have the opportunity to go live with their family in Florida and train there and just come here for the season. So it's kind of like everybody, yes, all the professional athletes are training, but everybody sort of isn't under the same roof training and isn't necessarily following the same X's and O's. So it's a little bit um, of an unknown how people show up when it comes to training camp and how prepared they are. Cause you know, our strength coach is preparing them for the demands of what he knows our coaches training camp is hopefully going to look like, but everyone's preparation looks a little bit different. So I would, I would say that's the major challenge is we don't have as much control over what's happening outside of the building. So it's hard to know always where the right starting place is when they do get in the building. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you've been with the Texans going into your fourth season officially. Yeah. What, what's the best part of your job? Man, I love the athletes so much. I think they're like really, really, really great men. Um, and I think like as an outsider, I didn't, you know, you have your perception of what professional athletes are going to be like, or at least I did. And I thought that they were going to be like these cocky hyper masculine competitive guys and they're really like some of the kindest like gentlest smartest most soft-spoken people I've been around and they're super gracious and kind and it's almost like they flip a switch and have this persona on the field but as a date from a day-to-day standpoint like they're really really great men and like really really goofy and kind and curious and yeah, I really, really love the athletes and like the relationships that we can create with them. And without getting you in trouble with Sue or anybody else <laughs> in the organization, what's one thing you what's one thing you wish you could change? Um, I think, and I think this is for all of us. Like, we all have to know when we're not the best person to handle something, right? Like, I have to have humility at some point to say no, our strength coach needs to take this over because they're better at performance training than, than I am, right? So we all like, could I take them all the way through the end of their rehab? Yes, but is Joe probably a better person to develop speed and power at the end stage of their rehab based on his education and training? Yes. So I think if we all like have the humility and look at the people around us and know like there's someone better to handle this and know when it's time to hand somebody off, um, I think that that would make things Otherwise, there's there's always turf battles and ego battles inside of every organization, every place I've ever worked. And I just think like having the awareness of the skill set of the people around you um, and having the humility to hand them off at the appropriate time. It's written right across your chest. 
<laughs> Sincerely, for the listening audience, Sierra's wearing a sweatshirt that says "Humble Over Hype." Is that uh, is does that happen to be a Houston Texans sweatshirt you're wearing? It's it's not. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, maybe you could share it with them. That's good. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, so then, um, if you could give some advice to any physical therapist, and and I, not to, I, I'm not going to talk about the elephant in the room because I, I, I've had so many female professionals in the world of mm. sports on as guests that my earlier guests like Sue um, mm. a few years back uh, may have been kind of obviously the minority and you are in somewhat a minority, but not as much as before. There's no so many more females in the world of sports, whether they are coaching, officiating, athletic training, or physical therapy training, uh, whatever, male or female, any gender, what, mm. what advice would you give to somebody that is looking to follow along your career path? Um, this is a quote from Coach K actually that I love, um, but he said it was um, a, a speech to his team um, one time when I was watching practice and he said his mom used to always tell him, um, get on the right bus and be with great people and it will take you to places that you could never go on your own. And so I think like in my career, I've always like, not necessarily gone to the most popular place. Like my residency was not the most popular place, but like I felt so connected to the people and I loved the people and I felt drawn there. I felt expansive there. Um, and so that's where I went. So I think like follow places um, where you can be around great people, um, follow places where you can have really, really deep connected relationships. And those people will fight for you harder than you could ever fight for yourself. I wouldn't have the job at the Texans if it weren't for my connections um, from my residency. I wouldn't have had the job back at Duke if it weren't for my connections back at Duke. And so like, you know, people will fight for you if you build great relationships with them. And so I've just always like prioritized relationships and made choices based on things that feel expansive and it hasn't led me astray yet. It doesn't seem to at all. That's great. <laughs> okay, so Sierra, if people want to kind of just follow your, 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 uh, your your path or whatever. Uh, obviously, I'll put some some links in the description to this podcast, like the Houston Texans. But what about LinkedIn or can we follow you on Instagram or anything of that nature? <laughs> my best friend told me that my social media game is weak, which is true. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not very loud on social media at all. So I'm the probably the most boring follow. I don't think I've followed. I haven't posted since like yeah, maybe like I don't know. That's okay. It just means you're focused on your career. That's, that's all that means. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not a big, uh, you're welcome to follow me on social media. You will be bored out of your mind. Um, but like, I'm always happy to talk to people, like really just reaching out, um, per, like on a message via LinkedIn or even email or anything like that. Like, I'm always happy to talk to people, um, about career stuff or bounce ideas with off of people. Like, yeah, I love it when people reach out to chat. So that's honestly like, a great thing for me. So just send a message through any of those things. And yeah, I'm sorry about my social media game. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. It's so but bad. I'll put a few things. This, this has been great. I really enjoy it. And, and I appreciate you taking a little time out. Hopefully this is kind of a quieter time of year. I know yeah, Houston, for sure. like you say, NCAA final four is taking place in your home mm -hmm. stadium. So, uh, well, you get a little break, but, uh, thank you for coming on. No, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for asking me. It was an honor to be on here. Well, that's a wrap for this episode, and I sure hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I want to thank Sierra, as well as the Texans organization, for allowing us to come on and have this conversation. And tune in every Monday, 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern, as we go into a new episode with a new guest, or maybe some that we've had on in the past that we'll bring back on. In the meantime, tell some friends about it. Leave us a comment as to what you're enjoying, what you'd like to see. Follow us on Instagram, click the subscribe, and we'll see you next week.